I'll be presenting on the Menominee language. Below and to the left, we see an alternate spelling commonly used in the literature, and to the right, we see their autonym, Mama Cheta. So to give a quick introduction, I'll start by looking at the family tree of Menominee. Uh, it's the single dialect of the Algonquian language family, which is the largest subfamily of the Algic language family. This Algic grouping was originally proposed by Edward Saper at the start of the 20th century. Um, and where before Wiyot and Yurok were classified separately under a different mother language known as Rituan, Saper proposed a genetic relationship between Wiyot, Yurok, and Algonquian. This came to be known as the Rituan controversy, although, as Campbell mentions in a book about historical linguistics of Native American languages, it is no longer very controversial at all, because Wiyot and Yurok don't appear to contain sound changes which aren't present in Algonquian languages. Um, the resulting Algic family is one of the largest indigenous language families in North America. Uh, in the presentation, I'm going to compare Menominee with some of its sister languages, including Fox, Potawatomi, Ojibwa, and Cree, the last of which is the most widely spoken Algonquian language. And just by convention, I'm going to be abbreviating all of these to F, P, O, and C, um, and M for Menominee. So here we can see some of the indigenous tribes and languages of northern Wisconsin. Uh, Menominee was spoken mostly in the northeast, where the smaller area highlighted by that red oval represents the contemporary Menominee reservation. Um, the name Menominee comes from the Ojibwa Menomen, meaning wild rice people. Um, and as we can see on this map, the Ojibwe were the Menominee's neighbors to the west, um, and they had extensive contact, as the Ojibwe were a larger tribe that um, also had contact with Europe. So just to talk about the sociolinguistic status of Menominee, um, despite some efforts at revitalization, today Menominee is critically endangered, and it has an estimated 50 speakers or fewer, none of whom are under the age of 50. So it's considered moribund, so destined to kind of die out on the UNESCO scale and in the catalog of endangered languages, which Lyle Campbell directs. Um, there's little digital support for the language, but there are almost 9,000 Menominee people living on the reservation today. So I'm going to give a quick sort of synchronic analysis looking at um, other sister languages of Menominee and focusing on the kind of phonemic in inventory and um, grammar of Menominee today. So the kind of standard orthography which is used um, for describing the phonemic inventory of Menominee was developed by Leonard Bloom Bloomfield. Um, he worked extensively with Algonquian languages, compiling phonologies, grammars, and lexicons of dialects like Fox, Ojibwe, Cree, and Menominee. Um, and his book, The Menominee Language, which was published after his death, served as the basis for a lot of work to come in the field of uh, Menominee linguistics. So here we see the phonemic inventory of Menominee. It has six short vowels with six corresponding long vowels. Um, and the vowel represented by an epsilon is not a lax mid-vowel, uh, like in the IPA, but it's a low front vowel, like E. Um, there are two diphthongs, which correspond to two semivowels, and there are also nine consonants. So to look at the monophthongs, um, all monophthongs are succeeded by a non-syllabic, so a vowel is never followed by a vowel or used to end a word. Um, and any word final syllabic sound um, necessarily involves the omission um, of a glide or a glottal consonant, which used to be at the end of that word. Um, syllabics in Menominee are also nasalized after nasal consonants, so mm and mm. Bloomfield also mentions kind of the important feature of vowel harmony, which is a morphophonemic phenomenon um, by which there's a raising from e and o to e and u, respectively, um, as conditioned by a high front vowel appearing later in the word. So we can take a look at these examples uh, to understand how this works. So we see the form moskamau, he emerges, and the conditional if he emerges, which becomes muskamit. So that first long vowel is heightened because there's, an, there's a high vowel later on in that word. Um, and equally, we see ke sesam, he cooks it, and the condi uh, it becomes um, the conditional if he cooks him, ki sesu. So to take a look at diphthongs, um, these almost always occur between non-syllabics, which include semivowels. Um, and this is with the exception of ua, which can be initial, although it is still kind of exceedingly rare. Um, the semivowels, by contrast, um, which are here shown as short diphthongs, kind of confusingly, um, don't have to be intervocalic. So although the difference is kind of difficult to discern for non-natives, ia and ua are distinct um, from ia and ua. So due to their similarity, they're not contrastive, but we do see an alternation um, so for, in this, in, for example, this, if I come, if thou comest, if he comes, um, the difference between the two syllable piyan and the one syllable piat is unmistakable to native speakers. 
um, Bloomfield also describes kind of rare doublets where both forms are acceptable. So we see this suniyan versus sunyan, both of which are acceptable co forms of coin. Um, so I'm going to touch now on some of the problems which vowel harmony poses. So um, as mentioned, it's the process of kind of assimilation, whereby we raise mid vowels earlier in a word if there's a high vowel um, or post-consonantal semi-vowel later in the word. Um, and here I'm going to follow a paper called A New Look at Menominee Vowel Harmony by Marianne Milligan to discuss some of the pitfalls that vowel harmony has. Um, it's proven incredibly difficult to frame this phenomenon as the descriptive height harmony, um, because feature analysis using height doesn't explain why the low front vowel blocks harmony, but the low back vowel doesn't. Um, and this is the issue of kind of transparency and opacity. So the low back vowel is transparent, whereas the low front vowel is opaque. Um, instead, uh, the paper proposes that we analyze this as a harmony around the feature plus ATR, so advanced tongue root. Um, and looking at the four features, uh, ATR, back, low, and round, we see that these can be used to um, perfectly pick out E from E and O from U. It's the only feature that distinguishes the two. Um, the second problem caused by vowel harmony um, is that triggers and targets of vowel harmony don't form natural classes. So the target is just a mid vowel or a O with a glottal sound, um, and the trigger is described as a high vowel or a post-consonantal glide. I won't touch on this in too much detail, but the paper proposes a solution um, involving a reframing of diphthongs as the nucleus of the syllable in order to solve the, uh, solve the problem of the trigger, um, and a theory that all mid-vowels can be targets, but the effects are negated if the vowel is followed by a glottal stop in order to handle this issue of the target. Um, unlike syllabics, non-syllabics can occur in sequence, so they're grouped in what are called clusters. Uh, permissible clusters are shown in the bottom table, and those shown in parentheses are not fully attested in Menominee, um, but are permitted to exist based on borrowings and sound changes from Proto Algonquin. Um, typically, only one non syllabic is permitted if it's in the word final or word initial position, um, and generally there can be up to three syllabics um, in, in sequence in a word. So the approximants or semi vowels can occur freely, as can all consonants. Um, they can occur both initially and finally, except for the glottal consonants, so the glottal fricative and the glottal plosive, glottal stop. Um, there are no voice stops in Menominee, but stops are often pronounced as leans, so this means that a slow opening um, kind of results in a sound where there's uh, somewhere between a voice and a voiceless stop. The sibilant S uh, varies freely to the pal palatalized SH sound, and the word final um, Glottal fricative is dropped or ranges to a semi vowel, so uh, yeah or wa. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some kind of common features of Algonquian languages, which are um, which are typically pretty interesting. Um, they are usually what's called polysynthetic or holophrastic, meaning that there's sort of an agglutination of morphemic units, which results in single words expressing the same meaning as, say, an entire sentence in English. Um, they also mark nouns as either animate or, anim or inanimate, um, although there is some debate to the topic of whether or not this distinction is made on purely semantic criteria. So not everything which is animate um, would be considered alive to an English speaker. Um, for instance, lightning is considered animate. Um, as we'll see, Proto-Algonquian has both long and short vowels and makes systematic use of atonicity and rhetorical lengthening. Uh, atonic words are words which are unstressed and uh, shortened across the board whereas rhetorically lengthened words are, as the name suggests, lengthened for rhetorical effect. And what's important about both of these is that it's a systematic process by which the same words are typically lengthened or shortened. Um, another notable feature is reduplication, whereby part of a verb stem is repeated in order to alter the meaning of the verb. Um, and we'll take a look at an instance of this in further detail now. So we're going to make reference to Proto-Algonquian, uh, but without discussing any specific sound changes, because this is still the um, synchronic part of this presentation. Um, so as mentioned, reduplication um, seems to date back to Proto-Algonquian and is pretty common. Um, there's no singular pattern of reduplication in Algonquian languages, but this is by far the most common one. So it's used to convey a sort of ongoing quality to the verb, and where we have a consonant followed by a long a, ah, we can append this to the start of the verb, again, kind of doubling it. And if there's no consonant, we simply insert a y after the first syllable. So um, we see that we have Proto-Algonquian wa pa me wa, uh, which maps to Menominee wa pa meo, um, and these mean he looks at him. 
Um, and then we see that we have the reduplicated form in Proto-Algonquin, wa wa pa me wa, which maps to, means he keeps looking at him and maps to Fox, Cree, Ojibwa, and Menominee forms, uh, which are all very similar, but have different endings. Um, and to exemplify the second rule, we see that the Proto-Algonquin apiwa um, maps to apeo, they both mean he sits, um, and can be reduplicated in Menominee um, to mean he keeps sitting um, as ayapeo. So to look at the kind of basic grammatical features of Menominee, it has five lexical categories, noun, negator, verb, particle, and pronoun, and verbs can be either transitive or intransitive. Um, as far as agreement and substance, substantive classes, uh, number is singular or plural, person can be first, second, third, or indefinite, and gender is either animate or inanimate. Um, agreement in Menominee is fusional, meaning that the same marker is used for both number and animacy, um, and they're only marked in the plural, as shown in this table. So we see that um, man, uh, pronounced ininu, uh, has no ending, whereas men, pronounces uh, ininuak, tells us that it is an animate uh, noun, whereas house, wikiwam, has no ending, and houses has wikiwaman, telling us it's uh, inanimate. Verbal negation is a pretty distinctive feature um, of menominee. It can be performed through the inflection of the verb or by kind of prepending preverbal particles to the verb. And there are three preverbal negators shown here in the above kind of tree. Um, they're pronounced kan, pon, and kat. Uh, the use of each is determined by the verbal order as shown in this diagram from a paper called Negation, Dubitatives, and Murativity in Menominee um, by Monica McCauley. Uh, cat is particularly interesting as a negator since it acts as a negator for murativity or a sense of surprise and disbelief in the fact in the face of a newly discovered fact. Um, kan is sort of the default negator used also in yes or no questions, and pon is used to negate imperatives. So just looking at these three these three examples from the conjunct order, um, looking just at the verb, we can read, um, I think she did it, as uh, and then we can read, she said that she didn't do it, as and then the most interesting cat, um, if he does not do this, he offends, which becomes um, or cat um, and so now I'm going to go into my diachronic analysis, looking at Menominee um, and Proto Algonquian. So we'll start with Proto Algic, which is estimated to have a little over, have kind of existed a little over. Um, 7,000 years ago on the west coast near what's now northern California. Um, some form of pre proto Algonquian is thought to have branched off shortly thereafter, spreading to the east and kind of to the north as, um, as uh, pre proto Algonquian, while pre Wiat and pre Uruk remained relatively stationary. Um, eventually, proto Algonquian began to form near modern day Michigan. Uh, and while proto Wiat and Uruk spread relatively little, proto Algonquian grew until it nearly spanned North America from east to west. So eventually these branched off into Plains and Central Algonquian and Proto-Eastern Algonquian, the last of which is a actual genetic grouping of its own. Um, so today Proto-Algonquian is one of the most kind of thoroughly reconstructed indigenous languages in North America. Um, we can start by taking a look at its phonological inventory um, compared to Menominee. So it has 11 consonants, two semivowels, four short vowels, and four long counterparts. Uh, we see that since Proto-Algonquian, uh, ch and sh have lost their liminalization. Um, but in Proto-Algonquian, there are no glottal stops. And um, as we'll see, the l and theta um, fall together with n. So theta in particular is an entirely theoretical sound, since it has coalesced with other sounds in all dialects um, of, of Algonquian. The semivowels remain the same. The vowels are similar, although Menominee gains these extra two pairs of vowels, including the low front vowel, which blocks harmony. Um, and Proto-Algonquian has no diphthongs in contrast with Menominee. So Bloomfield traced many of the Proto-Algonquian reflexes of Menominee words in his seminal work, but much of the work of precisely ordering the sound changes, which yielded Menominee from Proto-Algonquian, um, was done by post-Bloomfield post and linguist uh, Charles Hockett. Um, Hockett gives a phonological history of Menominee with 22 sound changes, which I'll briefly describe below. Um, then talk about some of the ramifications as shown in the diagram above. Um, many of the changes can't be dated, 
um, even relative to one another. And in the diagram, a change which points to another um, necessarily predates that other change. So in these examples, the rules likely had to have fed or bled the subsequent change in order to provide us with the information. Um, but up until sound change 10, we know very little. So this first sound change is important because um, later L and N fall together. And since theta stood in alternation with that laminalized sh, um, this has ramifications later on for menominee N. Um, this second rule, um, the first that part to the left is known as Godard's cluster. And that capital H refers to either glottal consonants, so either h or a glottal stop. Um, for the third rule, the coalescence of the x and the theta with h um, happens in every central Algonquian language, that, so that's pretty important. Um, this fourth sound change just says that a consonant followed by we coalesces, converts to o, and a consonant fo followed by ye becomes e. Um, Sound change five says that short vowel disyllables append or added h word finally, and other words drop final the final short vowel. Um, this is a rhythmically conditioned change, so the lost vowels must not have been given as much stress um, and were maybe uh, kind of routinely dropped or whispered in day to day speech. Uh, the sixth change says that ma becomes mo, but only in in syllables beyond the first. The seventh change says that initial we becomes o. The eighth change says that the S loses its contrast with the SH. Um, the ninth one says that <laughs> there's this kind of raising of E to E and E to E. Um, and sound change 10 says if the first two syllables of a non glottal are short, the second vowel is lengthened. Um, so sound change 11 says after long vowel is not followed by glottal consonant, we see the same raising as before. Um, sound change 12 says that um, the first, if, if it's the first in a cluster, N, -n becomes a H. Um, in Ojibwa, we see that voicing of Proto-Algonquian n spreads through the stop in a cluster, while in Menominee and Cree, it seems like the voicelessness of the rest of the cluster, um, be it a stop or a spirand, propagates backwards to the nasal. So this denasalization is thought to have maybe eventually yielded this change. Um, sound change 13, essentially there's a lowering basically in this environment with a consonant and then between two Ws. <coughs> um, so before W post-consonantal, we and we shifted back to wo and wo. Um, an interconsonantal um, with long e and short or long e, uh, both semivowels were deleted. Um, for rule 14, um, the second syllable of a glottal word, um, in the second syllable of a glottal word, we have this raising before a k or an m. Um, sound change 15, final clusters leave only their first consonant. Fine. Um, sound change 16, after the first long vowel of non-glottal, or everywhere in a glottal word, um, if the cluster is followed by a long vowel and no cluster, we shorten that vowel. Um, in sound change 17, short, even vowels lengthen before, are lengthened before a cluster, whereas long, even vowels um, in the second syllable of a non-glottal word are shortened if they're not bef immediately before a cluster. Um, sound change 18, this is the vowel harmony change, essentially this raising. Um, sound change 19, describes the coalescence of L and N as N. Um, sound change 20, after the initial non-syllabic, we see um, the same raising if it's not followed by a, um, by a post-consonantal uh, glottal sound. Sound change 21, there's an, if there's an odd short E sound, it becomes E in a non-glottal, and if it's not followed by a glottal or a semivowel. Um, sound change 22 describes the glide becoming more like the diphthong, so wa to wa and ya to ya after a non-syllabic. Haplology describes the process of deletion or elision of certain parts of a sound in a given word. One particularly recent haplology unique to Menominee takes the following form. If we have a sequence of a vowel, w, vowel, w, and vowel, and the second vowel is short, but either vowel 1 or 3 is long, then we can delete the segment with vowel 2 and one of the semivowels. So let's take a look at this example, meaning their brothers. Um, and using the pluralizer, oh wow. Um, we see an elision of au between the expected and attested menominee forms. Uh, so the expected, and the menominee, um, so this is expected. But we also see that the long a ah is shortened. This tells us that the change occurred before sound change 17, which then shortened any long vowel which was not in the second syllable of a non glottal word and wasn't followed by a cluster. So some other examples of the same haplology 
seem to have occurred after Soundchain 17, and interestingly these more recent haplologies are sometimes attested also in their longer forms. Since they're less far removed, Hockett kind of posits that these might be reconstructed through analogy. Um, we can take a look at the locative and map one proto-Algonquian locative ending, enki, to the menominee e, um, in the example of wikenki, meaning at his home. So through sound change 11, uh, it becomes wikenki. So if we take a look at sound change 11, we see after long vowels not followed by glottal consonants, we get this we to we. Um, sound change 12 tells us that wikenki becomes wikeki, where um, at the start of a cluster, n becomes h. And sound change 15 tells us that wikeki becomes wike, where we drop all but the first non-syllabic um, of a cluster at the end of a word. So we get wike, which is the attested menominee form. Um, so having established this, we see something more interesting in the locative, uh, which is if we take the example of neke uh, pahonenki, meaning at my waist, we would expect it to return the menominee neke pahone. Um, instead, we see the form neke pahone. Um, and in fact, that form ending with the low front vowel and a glottal sound doesn't exist at all. So this is the result of a generalization or an analogy whereby all forms confirm to the most typical case, even when the conditioning environment wouldn't have it be so. Um, so we'll look at some borrowings in Menominee. Um, the language with which Menominee had the most extensive contact was Ojibwa, and since the Ojibwa tribes were larger and their language is more widely spoken, um, there are many borrowings into Menominee and few loans into Ojibwa from Menominee. So the Ojibwa also had contact with early Europeans, and they served as sort of intermediaries for European words in Menominee. Um, an example given here is the French word for pig, koch, uh, which was borrowed into Ojibwa and subsequently into Menominee as uh, kokosh and kokos. Um, so here I'm going to mention three common features unique to or emblematic of words borrowed from Ojibwa and give some examples. So the cluster st um, doesn't exist in Menominee except in the case of borrowed words. So we see uh, manestanes um, from the Ojibwa manestanish, um, and we observe this cluster. Um, secondly, Menominee also borrowed a lot of Ojibwa nouns in both their singular and plural forms. Um, so they follow Ojibwa inflections for number, for instance. Um, the word island, uh, menes, um, comes from the, or becomes menesian, which kind of uh, comes from the Ojibwa um, counterpart. So we see menes becoming menesan. Uh, it's kind of like how in English we borrow Latin endings for Latin words sometimes. Um, and then one of the most common borrowings from Ojibwa was of names. So even when there existed similar names in Menominee, um, and this also resulted in a sort of overextension where Ojibwa-like names were created in Menominee. So we can take, for instance, uh, Machikewis, which is borrowed from the Ojibwa Manchikewis. Um, and the fact that the first two vowels are both short tells us that it's not a foreign-sounding word in Menominee, or that it is a foreign-sounding word in Menominee, sorry. Um, in Menominee, they tried to inflect the name with the Ojibwa feminine, resulting in uh, Machikekwewis. Um, in Menominee, this means silly maiden or eldest sister, which reflects a kind of erroneous mapping since the two words have distinct forms in Ojibwa. Um, so here I'm going to talk about rhetorical lengthening, which I mentioned above. Um, it's common to a lot of Algonquian languages and involves lengthening an emphasis on a particular vowel in a word. Um, if a word was systemically, systematically pronounced with rhetorical lengthening, um, it can help us understand when it was borrowed into Menominee. So with the example of salt given here, um, it shouldn't be acceptable in Menominee according to sound change 16, uh, which dictates that the long vowel a ah should be shortened, and 17, which would have the short vowel a eh be lengthened. Um, and this tells us that the word is certainly borrowed from Ojibwa and after the changes 16 and 17. Um, atonic words, um, atonicity developed with um, after Proto-Algonquin, and kind of somewhere before Menominee. Um, like rhetorical lengthening, the same words were pronounced atonically, so pronouns, particles, common nouns. Um, and the kind of recursive reshaping of certain words as tonic or atonic um, created difficulties um, in reconstructing some of their phonological histories. Uh, so for instance, it seems atonic words were unaffected by sound change 10, um, just simply remaining short and unstressed, where sound change 10 would have lengthened them. Um, as an example of atonic words, which we can account for, um, we can take the singular, singular personal pronouns given here as kila, nila, and wila. Uh, these are typically pronounced atonically as just kila, nila, wila. Um, 
And following sound change five, which adds the first uh, the word final semivowel, we would have kila, nila, wila. Um, and sound changes one and nineteen, which account for the coalescence of theta with n, we get the attested menominee forms kena, nena, wena. Um, so this was the last phenomenon um, and reconstruction I wanted to discuss. So this brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Um, here's a picture of the Menominee River, which flows through what was once Menominee land. Um, and here's my bibliography. Thank you. <laughs>